Welcome everyone to the second panel here in, of uh, economic development in low-income communities. We have a wonderful panel here and uh, an excellent moderator, and I'm going to introduce you to her. She's Lisa Hodges. She's a senior advisor at Oystery Consulting. Lisa is an attorney with over 15 years of diverse experience in affordable and public housing, large-scale urban redevelopment, and neighborhood revitalization. She has served as a director of large-scale urban redevelopment and neighborhood revitalization, and uh, is also the director of the Boston Housing Authority and as the development advisor of the District of Columbia Housing Authority. In these capacities, she has managed a portfolio of over 100 million in large-scale redevelopment projects and has represented the DCHA in district-wide and national housing policy. Uh, Lisa currently is an adjunct professor at the Howard University. And uh, just a minute. And there she is teaching uh, urban housing seminar focus on affordable housing development. So uh, give us a warm welcome to Lisa, please, and take it away. Thank you, Gaurav. Welcome, welcome. I was really geeked up when I was asked to moderate this panel because we've got some real rock stars here in the area of um, urban development and sustainable urban development. Um, I will start uh, and meet to my far left, Imral Kays, who is the founding member of Engineers Without Borders in Bangladesh. I think he might get the prize for traveled farthest to be here. <laughs> um, or the, I think Terry came from China. So later on, we'll have to see. Uh, and then also, um, he is the chapter lead for uh, Architecture for Humanity in Bangladesh, in, in Dhaka. Uh, then we have uh, Teresa Huang, who is most recently has completed a uh, Rose Fellowship. Uh, she is now an architect with Skid Row Housing Trust in LA. And she's going to talk about some really um, exciting pro projects that she's worked on. Uh, we have. Uh, finally, Peter Cohen, who is the executive director of the uh, Council of Community Housing Organizations, and he is an urban geographer, and I'm really interested to hear what he has to say about doing all of that. Um, he's a thought leader in the Bay Area in the area of land use policy. Uh, we are still expecting uh, David Baker, whose um, work is exhibited in the, uh, the um, Autodesk exhibit out there curated by uh, John Carey uh, and uh, Courtney Wilson, uh, the Richardson Apartments, which is a supportive um, housing development, and we hope to see him uh, shortly. Uh, so I will now turn it over to Teresa. Can you hear me, or do I need a mic? Oh, yeah. Mic? OK. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm very excited to be here and, and really just share the work that we've been doing over at the Skid Row Housing Trust. Um, you know, I really want to focus on eco-development through the lens of homelessness and within the context of Los Angeles. And so in terms of a little bit of background, the Skid Row Housing Trust um, is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. Um, and we have been creating um, homes for over 20 years for the homeless population through permanent supportive housing. You know, I think I want to stress that as developers, we're not just, you know, creating units on the market, but really um, trying to develop places for people to really call home. So in terms of context, um, Los Angeles really is um, the capital of homelessness in the country, and Skid Row is the concentrated center of it all. So in a small neighborhood directly adjacent to downtown Los Angeles, um, in an area that's about half a mile wide and half a mile long, you have over 4,000 people living on the streets and in the shelters without a permanent place to call home. And so, you know, I think we all realize that homelessness isn't just kind of a linear consequence of the recession or unemployment, but really is a complex and tangled problem. You know, you're dealing not only with poverty, but people dealing with physical and, and mental illnesses as well. So to really address 
um, the problem holistically, we implement on-site social services in addition to providing permanent homes for our populations. And so our residents have leases and, and full tenant rights, but we've also integrated on-site social services to really begin to get at the root causes of homelessness. So we have primary health care, mental health experts, um, substance abuse counselors right within their building. And so we found that because it's, you know, basically in their home and there are less barriers and um, services are easily accessible, the, the path to recovery tends to be more long-term and stable, um, uh, um, unless otherwise, you know, having to go off-site and, and find other different types of, of services. Um, I wanted to focus on one specific project that we've been working on. Um, these are the Star Apartments that is currently under construction and is designed by M Michael Malton Architecture. And, um, for us, this project is really, really exciting because I think it's really pushing where we want permanent supportive housing to go. Um, programmatically, it's pretty much our mo most comprehensive building that we have. Um, you can see on top, we have the, the residential apartments, we have retail and social services on the ground floor. But I think the real exciting part of the building is that um, on the second floor, we have over 13,000 square feet of community building activities. And so over the years, with all the different buildings that we've, been, we've placed into service, you know, we understand that you know, the clinical aspects of services are extremely important. You, know, you, you need your psychiatrists, you need your nurses, but these um, social activities you know, that really foster community building, like yoga, gardening um, are extremely therapeutic. And so we've been able to really physically integrate this into the building, which has been um, a huge potential resource in, in social service spaces. So you'll see we have over 1,500 square feet of edible community gardens, a, a running track, an exercise room. We have a computer lab, um, classrooms, pretty much everything that we really need in order to um, address holistically um, what a sustainable lifestyle should really be. Um, in terms of physical sustainability, um, we're using several strategies to really maximize different efficiencies. Um, existing on site, you can see we have this, there was this uh, original two-story concrete building, and I think, you know, usually in Los Angeles, it's all about um, knocking things down and making way for the new, and I think we saw it as a complete waste if we just got rid of this building that was you know, constructed in 2003. And so we really wanted to reuse as much um, of the existing envelope um, and, and uh, structural slabs as possible. And so we've, we've created this new concrete superstructure um, that is self-sustaining and pierces through the building um, and is going to be the, the platform where the new uh, units sit on top. Um, in terms of a, uh, another construction method that we're beginning to experiment with, we're using prefab construction, which I think, um, you know, I want to highlight a few of the different types of efficiencies that, that, that it affords us. Um, you know, we were dealing with a very controlled construction environment. You know, we, we're not in the field, so we've been able to minimize a lot of the material waste. Um, we're able to control the building envelope a lot tighter, and so we're expecting higher energy performance on the operation side. Um, and you know, in addition to the kind of the low VOC paints and sealants to create healthy interiors, um, it also affords us economic efficiencies, which I think when you're dealing with affordable housing and very tight budgets, um, I think it, it's another potential benefit. And so uh, the, the prefab units are only about 25% of the actual total construction budget, but uh, actually accounts for over 65% of the total building gross square footage. So if, to give you an idea of how much is actually saved, um, not only in money, but because we can work simultaneously on site and begin to build the units off site, um, we've been able to cut down the construction schedule by about six months, which in developer terms, you know, time is sometimes even more valuable than, than money. And so the project is targeting LEED Platinum certification. Um, but I think when we talk about you know, high impact, effective community development, we always need to incorporate resident engagement and participation in the process. And so we've ho we held multiple workshops with our existing resident community in order to really get their direction and feedback on the types of programs and, and building uses that would be really appropriate um, for the building design so that we're not building on assumption but actually incorporating um, lessons learned and um, resident experience. And so I think this is also a way to stress that, you know, we're not, uh, the buildings and our projects not only service a community, but 
um, you know, we're not just giving design to, but it's an opportunity to really develop with the community as well. Um, and, you know, to just kind of summarize really quickly, I think, you know, aspects of, of healthy eco-development really needs to stress both the physical and the social aspects of sustainability. Um, you know, it's very important that we have um, high-performing, you know, low-energy-consuming buildings and, and um, you know, innovative material usages, but I think also integrating high performance in terms of programs is, is equally as important, um, especially when we're dealing with a homeless population and, and focusing on creating um, places of recovery. So, thank you. going to take a minute to uh, tee up uh, David Baker's uh, presentation. Thank you, Teresa, so much. <laughs> and thank you, David, for joining us. No Welcome. So while we're doing this, I'm going to call Emerald up because uh, Emerald uh, doesn't have a presentation. He's just fabulous all on his own. So why don't you come on up? Thank you all. Uh, I just want to share some of my experience with all of you, which uh, you might not find it for related with the architecture or any kind of eco-development in this big stage or big something, but something really small and in my life, but which encourages me to understand the eco-development or what is called the eco things in our life. Like, uh, in uh, if you have any idea about Indian culture or Bangladeshi culture, uh, usually the women wear some kind of clothes, which is uh, pretty 12 feet long and three feet height, something. So this kind of clothes, usually mothers use it, and probably later in a festival time, when after one year or two years use, the mother usually go to the any shops to tailor it for the for her children and daughters to make some two other clothes from these big clothes. And this is pretty familiar scenario in India, Bangladesh, or any other things. To recycle it, which also allows mothers to become happy and also the daughters to become happy to get the new clothes from her mother's clothes. And later, after one year or two years later, probably when the daughters get up, uh, getting beer, so it becomes another clause to for the household accessories and other uses. And after all, like uh, when it's torn out, then pro uh, they use it, cut it in several parts, and use for cooking and other materials to try to pick some dishes in a hot pot or anything else. So I just. This is a common scenario in our lively style and in Bangladesh, India, or in other countries, uh, which uh, you may prefer as a third world countries. But I want to show it like how a clause can transform into three different criteria and three different uses in our life. And this is what makes me realize that what is actually eco-friendly or eco things, like how we can minimize our resource, how we can recycle the things, and how we can maybe improve the happiness also. It also creates the social bonding between three or two types of peoples, like the girls, household, olders, and the mothers, also the fathers, everyone's. So this is a learning during my architectural study, study period, and which influenced me really to get come up with the idea of eco and something really how we can integrate this kind of recycling system or how we can import this kind of uh, integration between the family members and other social characters. So thus, 
actually we can improve to make it much more eco-friendly and eco-development. So it, it, it's sometimes in Bangladesh and India or other part of the world, we call it like village life system or anything like this that uh, on women from the elder world who uses the clothes for the younger one and later another one use the same things. But this is my idea that how we can revitalize this village system of integration between the social uh, different kind of peoples in an urban context or how we can uh, you can say ecological viability and economic viability to into our structural system and the housing development or any kind of things. So that also called the energy consumption, which we are calling sustainable energy and anything. Resource management is a big factor for the eco-development. And also it's called eco-learning, like uh, one generation to another generation, they are learning how the life system can be much more eco-friendly and ecologically. So this is all the things what I mean by the eco-development for low-income communities or any other communities which is really needed in current situation. And for, to me, like, uh, we're not thinking about the too big in the in a urban situation or like, like if you go to the open architecture network, you'll find some of my projects. Like uh, most of my projects is based on two small things, but which can impact in a bigger situation or bigger, much more bigger community. Like there is a project called uh, mobile tea stall vending. Uh, uh, this is my first visit to San Francisco, and I've seen there are lots of vendor, vendors on the pedestrian and other level, and they are consuming lots of energy for uh, vending popcorn and other things, other issues, but which you can easily uh, manipulate it in uh, in a more much more environment friendly way and without much less energy consumption. So one of my tried was in Bangladesh with a small modular system like four feet by four feet bending portable, which we can go with the solar energy and also the we can make the ice cream something like this. Also, we can use a small motor to dry the popcorn for it, which will not cost like 500 or $400 more, more to produce these kind of things. So this can help to get at least two or three people for the, for the community to earn and live for things. If you go to the open architecture network, you'll find another projects like two-story school structure, which I built with only $5 per square feet in a rate, which is from the recycled bamboo and recycled metal, which is from the uh, recycled metal shop and other shops. Uh, you will get how a person, a family can live in a 1.5 feet width and 30 feet long structure, two story. So probably uh, lots of people will think how one person can only sleep in a 1.5 feet width. But if you visit that project or if you ever see the pictures of the projects, you will realize actually as a human being, we do not need lots of space to live, to survive in a situation. And this is what, this is really, really basic things that how, what kind of space we actually need to survive in a better way and how we can make it transform it into modern context, like with the modern facilities and the, all the modern, other facilities. So the, it's better uh, if you go to Open Architecture Network, it, it will go 10 or 12 projects of mine. And all the projects are small, but which we can easily transform in a larger scale or any other other things. And it's all re only in my learning process, like maybe after 10 years or 15 years later, probably I can come up with some solution for the urban context in a big, larger perspective. Thank you all.
Hi, um, I'm David Baker, and I'm going to talk uh, about a project we did in Oakland, uh, finished a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Tassa Faranga Village. Uh, Tassa Faranga is named after a, a naval battle that the United States lost, so it's, it's not an Indian or Native American name. Um, about 3,000 sailors died. And uh, it was military housing, and then it got converted into a housing authority uh, housing. Um, this uh, shows the site, and you can see that orange line is a delineator between the industrial zone and the residential zone. Uh, you can see the difference in texture, which is really quite amazing. Uh, and uh, that, this was one of the uh, controversies around this project because uh, this is the interface. And uh, you know, there's a concern about jobs. Uh, one thing, do we have a pointer up here? Maybe I can just point. Uh, what's interesting uh, is that there was a, a community center, a park, and then a school and a library there. And along that orange line, there was, there was no way to walk or bicycle. You had to kind of uh, drive off in the neighborhood like that to get, get back in. I'll, I'll just do the, this is good, the pointing. I like the pointing. Um, so uh, this shows uh, what was there. It was a, a classic uh, 60s uh, housing um, authority development. It was fenced. Uh, it had a gate uh, that kept the good people in with the bad people, kept the cops out pretty much. And you can see how it doesn't relate to the grid. Uh, this is uh, what we did. This is our, our I, if people are familiar with the Congress of New Urbanism, uh, we're not uh, new urbanists, but this is extending the grid. So we actually uh, put this street through and connected with a bike path up there to the school and library and basically extended the grid of the streets either as uh, auto streets or pedestrian um, use. So uh, as part of this effort, we, uh, the Oakland Housing Authority are a great client. They had no requirements for doing uh, green anything beyond the code, but they're very open to things. And we said, uh, hey, there's this new pilot program, lead, lead uh, neighborhood design. Uh, why don't we go after it? And they said, OK, how much does it cost? And it was five grand or something. So, so we did it. So this became, um, I think, the first lead certified gold plan in California uh, through various uh, strategies. Uh, you know, all kinds of uh, proximity issues. These are the green stra strategies. Uh, they are characterized by being really simple and uh, not particularly innovative. Um, you know, we exceeded the Title 24 standards by 30 to 46 percent. Those of you who are architects know that's actually really difficult, but, uh, you know, you do it with better windows and better insulation. Uh, we have solar domestic hot water, uh, provides uh, 70 percent plus. That's huge because in California, in this climate, actually taking showers is uh, using washing your hands is one of your biggest energy uses. Uh, there's a solar PV arrays, various ones that total 180 um, kilowatts, uh, which is a pretty good sized solar array. Uh, one thing we did, and not only did our client go along with this, but we talked the Oakland Department of Public Works. Uh, and I don't know if you deal with departments of public works. Are there any people? Anyway, they, they are not your most radical folks. And uh, we talked them into allowing us to do 100% stormwater management, including the streets. Uh, this is something you're just being to be able to do in San Francisco. And they just kind of said, oh, OK, you know, as long as you fix it. Uh, there's an existing factory building, which we uh, used more than 90%, just reused it by keeping the floors and the walls, the roof. Uh, keeping as much as it as possible. Uh, we recycled uh, t over 94% of our construction and demolition waste. But you know the, the best thing about this and the, mo the greenest thing is it's a, it's a uh, brownfield urban site so that uh, we were uh, fixing something that was, I think, actually fairly toxic, uh, both in terms of chemicals, but also uh, uh, the, the setup was toxic. I and mean, it was very interesting. We had community meetings, and uh, I remember we, we unrolled a set of plans in somebody's unit and were talking about what they thought. And they said, and a cockroach ran across the plans. And the woman said, honey, when can I move? So uh, anyway, so uh, it's a seven and a half acre site. Uh, we added a little bit uh, to, it, to the site. But it started out, one of the things we did uh, is we added a fairly dense building, apartments down there. Um, and uh, we made it look different. That's the community space, uh, and uh, 
became, it becomes a real symbol uh, for, for the project. There's a little tiny kid there, but that, that kid is really small. That building isn't that big. So. Uh, and then it has a garage, a structured garage, so this allowed us to get rid of any parking lots on the site, except for Habitat. Uh, but anyway, that's a different story. There's some, uh, I'll show you that. But uh, this is, so this is a parking garage that has uh, units in front of it so you don't see it. So that's the same building on the, the back. And then on top, there's a little tot lot and a green garage, you know, green roof over the garage. Um, and then this is looking from that building to the, the second typology, which are all these townhouses that are uh, four to five bedrooms. They, uh, and they all have washers and dryers, which is a big request uh, in Oakland, big families to have your own washer dryer. So they are, uh, these are uh, interesting in that they don't have a back, these particular types of townhouses. This shows where the townhouses are located. Uh, one of the, we won this competition, it was actually a competition, sort of a RFP proposal, and uh, we thought we won it because we were so smart, because we had come up with all these different uh, types of buildings which made it look really diverse. But then we found out our, the person who had done the planning, who is a new urbanist, had a fee that was a million dollars more than us. So. Uh, that, I think, entered into the calculation. We thought it was a really good fee. I don't know. So uh, this, is, uh, this is some of the townhouses. These actually have backs, but they're little townhouses. We did the San Francisco idea where the plans are, are very standardized, but we, we designed different elevations and then uh, mixed them up randomly so you really don't realize that you know, there, there's some repetition. And that's, I think, a, that's a, you know, when you think of the projects, you think of everything looking the same. And uh, this shows that again. These are these are actually we call them a pinwheel unit, and you can rotate these and mirror them. And there's really only one. That's the same unit, the same building, but it's just uh, twisted around so you can't tell. Uh, you can see the green infrastructure down here. These are all swales alongside the street. The stormwater from the street and the buildings runs into that for uh, filtration. Um, this is uh, one of the street grids that was taken through as a pedestrian path. Uh, with the townhouses. And this is, again, the townhouses. I'm showing this because this was another strategy. The planter, the uh, drown spout uh, drains into this large box, which is an infiltration, uh, it's a filtration and delay strategy. But it's also, uh, you know, the, the word that's coming to be used a lot is biophilic. And, you know, you, if you get a lot of plants around, and we, we're believers in a lot of plants, uh, people are uh, happier and calmer. So I, I can describe it. Uh, and then this shows the uh, habitat, uh, the, uh, you know, the people who do the uh, sweat equity, uh, they came, the Oakland Housing Authority decided to uh, get them involved. They do uh, ownership housing. They're originally going to go up here on this site, and they said, could we have a, you know, 12-foot fence with a razor wire between us and the housing authority? And we said, you guys are liberals. You don't really want to do that, do you? And then, well, you know, it's, you have to face reality. But anyway, so we, well, we talked to them, and they wanted to do phases. This is 22 units, which is a big project for them. And we talked them into uh, dividing it into two parts uh, so they could phase it. And then it's integrated. It's actually not fenced, which is, uh, was a big victory. Uh, we did use this as an intern development program. Uh, we <laughs> got the, the uh, younger architects in the office got to do the client interaction and, and find out what it's like to deal with clients, which is always an educational situation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and they, so they designed that. And then we actually did the working drawings as a as a job. This shows Habitat, uh, and some of the people from our office helped build it, too. This is under construction. You can see the, the union carpenters and carpentry in the background, and Habitat, a little simpler uh, because of their limitations in construction, but it shows the little houses. Fantastic program. Every uh, family has to put 500 hours of sweat equity in, and there were some families that actually had done twice as much because they were helping the other families. Uh, so this, uh, there was a, uh, a building here that was a uh, uh, old pasta factory uh, that had been abandoned, and most recently uh, they were manufacturing methamphetamine. This is what it looked like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, this shows that it's uh, housing for people uh, living uh, with uh, medical condition, and there's a clinic in there for it uh, as well. So uh, that that worked out really nicely. Uh, this is a, a really wonderful story. This this woman uh, Kelly Carlisle uh, grew up in the neighborhood and actually visited the site with her mother uh, when it was Housing Authority site. And, and there, there's a park there that's part of this was uh, 
Oakland Park and Rec sort of fixed up a little bit, which meant, I don't know what it meant, they mowed the lawn and kind of fixed it up a little bit. And uh, but she went there with her mother, they, they were you know, basically a bunch of people you know, kind of hanging out, dealing drugs. And her, her mother said, you know, you can't play here. And they left, and she was in the military, she came back, and she was, uh, decided to, she formed this uh, organization called Acta Non Verba, you know, which is deeds, not words, and uh, decided to uh, start a uh, program for school kids of uh, uh, doing vegetable gardening, doing a farm. And she uh, s was next to, and this is the kind of the multiplier effect, which I think is so uh, great about these, is that uh, she saw the, you know, the green buildings and everything. She said, oh, I'm going to put my farm here. So she did it. This is the farm. Uh, there's Kelly. And then she, it's a thing. Local school kids uh, do the farming. Uh, they have a farm stand three days a week during the season. And they sell to the residents of the community, and then they have uh, bank accounts, individual bank accounts, and they get money put in the bank account for their, um, you know, college education. Pretty wonderful. So anyway, and these are the, the kids, uh, really diverse. And uh, uh, the other thing, uh, it was interesting, this was published recently in the New York Times. We actually, you know, the journalist is going, well, what about positive effects? I'm, I'm winding up. Yeah, uh, positive effects, you know, is there a drop in crime? And, and so I called the housing authority woman. She says, well, you know, we did have a, a murder, but uh, it wasn't really us because it was just a, a gang funeral. And one of the guys, you know, there was a altercation and there was a, a chase and they chased a guy down and shot him to death, like in the middle of the site. But everything else went down. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's, it's quite, quite uh, so there actually was a, about a 25% drop in crime, even counting the murder that, were, that was just kind of uh, incidental. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really good thing. One, the other thing I'll just finish too is that um, p there's all these co-benefits, like when you do the uh, greening of the streets and put all the, the swales and make the streets narrower to have less uh, impermeable surface, people drive slower. And if you go there, you'll see that the kids will actually cross the street carefully, but they don't have that terror, and the uh, cars go about half as fast. Thank you very much. And. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, so I was put last. I, um, I thought it would be a good idea because I'm the least qualified to be speaking at an architecture conference. I'm not an architect or designer or a planner. Um, I'm just a geographer. Uh, and Lisa had asked you know, about urban geography. I, I, you know, I, I got interested in studying cities. I got a master's degree from San Francisco State and figured I was living in one of the best laboratories to understand why things end up the way they are, not just physically, but the social dynamics that make a city a place in constant change and turmoil and politics. And I'm in affordable housing now, but um, as a geographer, uh, a lot of my work uh, is, is sort of at various degrees removed from the work that David and others do here, which is at the site level or the project level, trying to implement good ideas and good policy. Um, one of the key concepts we have in geography is scale. Uh, and, and, you know, sort of, I like the idea of you're sort of zooming in and out. Uh, and you see different things at different scale. And when you're looking at the level of a site, you see a number of things, and there's a number of policies and principles and values that you're trying to integrate into a design. But if you change your scale and step back, you know, two, three degrees, whatever it is, to the scale of a community or a city or the region, you see different things. You see some less data, but you also see some different things cumulatively that you couldn't see at the project level. Uh, so I want to play with that a little bit and, and think about the question of um, eco-development communities from a, a much higher scale, uh, of, at least at the city level, if not the regional level, and put it in the context of smart growth. Who here has heard this term smart growth? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. So my thing, it's not so easy being green, the challenge of equitable smart growth. And for any of you who have been involved in the smart growth conversation, you know that the, the question about where equity fits in the smart growth paradigm is really at the core of all the debates. Whatever you want to call it, smart growth, urban infill, TOD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
Or I love this one. I found it on like Wikipedia, compact, walkable, transit-oriented, mixed-use communities that preserve and enhance natural resources. Smart growth. Whatever you want to call it, uh, it's, we know what we're talking about. These are typical images. I think this is off the EPA's website, you know, EPA's into smart growth now. And these are the kinds of communities, you know, most of them are kind of maybe smaller scale or mid-scale, not San Francisco, that look and feel right. Again, I'm not an architect, designer, planner, so you tell me what the critiques are. But these are the, the sort of typical images of what we think are the good elements of smart growth communities. Um, there's this kind of urban green utopia. These are actually the 10 established from smartgrowth.org principles of smart growth. From you, you probably recognize these mixed land use, walkable neighborhoods, a range of housing opportunities, uh, even around process, encourage community and stakeholder collaboration and development decisions. We heard an earlier case study. All good stuff, preserve open space. One could not argue with any of these principles, and in some, they become this kind of green urban utopia. So how could there be any downside? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a fair question, right? I mean, it all sounds so good. So for starters, a green urban utopia is not necessarily an equitable urban utopia, especially in low-income communities. Um, I would argue that smart growth in the macro still relies on the basic forces of real estate capitalism. That's how most things get built. Uh, some of the projects we see here are fantastic because they have tremendous amounts of public subsidy. But the rest of it's all built through private capital for the most part. And so we're still relying on those same forces, whether we like it or not. And we're trying to shape them and steer them and convince them to do more of the right thing. So in low-income communities where the vulnerability is higher, uh, it raises the question about how equitable are those outcomes. Um, the point here is not to dismiss smart growth. I don't want to be just a polemic, although I may sound like one, but to insist that the hard questions about the unintended consequences not be ignored. Um, I want to and geographers also uh, talk about scale, and I can't do anything without maps. So here are my maps. I, I want to give you an idea of, of what we're looking at here in the Bay Area, in our region. Uh, and this is something that's happening across the country. Um, increasingly, the emphasis is on focusing much of our regional growth into urbanized areas. Uh, we have um, a sustainable community strategy, as they call it here in California, that's now being put together. It's essentially adopted or near adopted for the Bay Area, same with the other eight or nine regions of the state. The vision for San Francisco Bay Area is that 70% of all future growth be channeled into existing urbanized areas. They call these priority development areas. This is essentially the counter to you know, decades of suburban sprawl. We're actually going to use our land more efficiently, which is the, the fundamental principle of an ecologically superior way of development than sprawling all over the place. Everybody essentially agrees to that. This map shows in purple where that 70% of future growth should go in that perfect width. There's a number of nodes, kind of a polynodal map with the three big uh, nodes of San Francisco, kind of Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, and San Jose, and then a number of small uh, kind of uh, suburban and exurban nodes, and then these, these key corridors. That's where we should see most of it. Another map, though, there are so-called communities of concern identified throughout the urbanized Bay Area. Now, communities of concern is this interesting term that was come up with by our regional agencies. It's sort of a formula of a combination of a certain percentage of folks in that community who are below a certain income level and or a certain percentage of folks in that community who are people of color. So it could be one or both or either. Nevertheless, they've done this kind of calculation based on some census data, and you can see these these uh, areas on the map are communities of concern. The interesting thing, as it happens, is that many of the priority development areas where 70% of the growth is to go also happen to be where the most vulnerable communities exist. So we have a, a, a bit of a, of a tension point. Now, this makes sense. I think I find it amusing that smart growth is the rage, and folks are sort of searching for the perfect smart growth communities. And aha, finding out there are many of the neighborhoods that evolved and developed sort of you know, pre-automobile. They are the smart growth places. They're the logical places to put our communities. They just happen to have been somewhat left behind, and now we want to return to them as the new smart places to be. 
So we have this tension point element wanting to be put where we have communities of concern or communities that are vulnerable to, say, gentrification, displacement, uh, you know, uneven access to resources, et cetera. I want to quickly go through a local case study. Um, so the question is, will low-income communities benefit from smart development or simply be in harm's way? Question. Um, this is a San Francisco neighborhood in the Mission District, so we're drilling down in our scale from the region to the city, from the city to a neighborhood, and from the neighborhood to a sub-neighborhood. If folks are familiar with the Mission District in San Francisco, um, it's been a predominantly Latino neighborhood for the last four or five decades. Um, it's actually quite, um, it's quite diverse, actually, but it's predominantly Latino and has that kind of cultural uh, identity. There's also um, uh, you know, a lot of um, interest in infill development in the mission because you can see here relative to the downtown, the central business district, it's in a perfect proximity. It's close to transit, it's close to jobs, it's close to services, it's close to the culture. And so it becomes a so-called hot market neighborhood. Uh, we did this mapping uh, during, if you will, the last dot-com boom just about a decade ago from now looking at over some little three-year tranches, uh, data from our rent stabilization board of legal evictions. So we actually have rent control in San Francisco, and when evictions are legal, uh, they're recorded. And uh, I won't go through all the data details here, but just to give you a real broad brush, this is 1990 to 1993, a three-year period. And these are the recorded legal evictions in the, in the neighborhood of the Mission District. You can see the number of them. I won't get into the color. That's a longer story, but just look at the volume. You go into 1994 to 97 as the real estate market sort of recovered from an early recession in the 90s and started to heat up, and the number of evictions increases, and then on into the next three-year tranche, and then the final. And this, this swings, the number of evictions, just swings right up with the real estate boom that happened during that time, and then starts to come down again after 06, and we're starting up again. This doesn't mean that it's causal. You know, infill development does not necessarily cause these evictions. There's a lot of stories behind them. But it does, it does give pause, and it raises that question again. As I said, you know, will the emphasis on infill development as an ecologically sustainable or ecologically preferable way to grow in the macro, will it actually have a positive effect at the site or neighborhood level, or are there unintended consequences that we haven't necessarily figured out how to control for? And I would argue that in a place like San Francisco, where the real estate dynamics are so intense, uh, you definitely have unintended consequences, and we haven't figured out how to solve for those yet. Just want to end by pointing out uh, that uh, this has been uh, something that's been discussed by a lot of folks in the Bay Area. One of the things I love about being a polit policy activist in San Francisco in the Bay Area is there's so many folks who are thinking very hard about these difficult questions and are great activists. And uh, this is just kind of one conceptual way to approach smart growth, is not to take the 10 principles uh, at their face, uh, which seem, in some respects, rather simplistic, but to actually have a number of principles that get to the core of equity, and that smart growth is ultimately about creating equitable outcomes through these various lenses of affordable housing, of having investment, capital investment, without then creating displacement, uh, with having safe and healthy communities, uh, dealing with some of the fact that you know urban communities have been subjected to a lot of our industrial pollution for years, and on down, down the line to community power which is a little different than saying let's have a community charrette process. It's ultimately that there's community power that's created through the investment in those neighborhoods, right? There's a control there that's the next level up. So these are some kind of operating of principles, uh, kind of a coalition's come together in this region called the Six Wins for Equity as another way to approach smart growth so that if we can, ultimately, ideally, the utopia is sort of a, a, a green and equitable smart growth outcome. So I, uh, I leave that as a kind of uh, question or, or fodder for discussion. And who do I turn this over to now, Lisa? Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for our panelists. Um, Teresa, 
uh, you know, working with uh, the hard to house populations and with, um, you know, homeless, the need services on site, those services cost money. And serving a low income population and as a developer, you know, my bottom line is, you know, how can I fund it? So I want to ask you, how do you as an architect, as a designer, um, make the argument for the inclusion of those sustainable elements in a development that costs more money but don't really yield, uh, you know, a return on the economic bottom line? How do you make that argument? Um, I think with any successful project, it's all about collaboration and, and partnerships. And so, um, the services piece, I mean, we know it's vital to the, the true success of our projects, um, but it's harder to get financing for those um, types of programs. And so getting grant funding, uh, but more partnering with existing nonprofit organizations, um, you know, so for example, with our um, urban, urban gardens, you know, there are many, many urban agriculture organizations that already kind of have the, the infrastructure, the expertise, um, and it's about bringing them in um, and really creating space for their organizations to flourish while simultaneously um, creating a benefit for our resident population as well. So I think it really is about, you know, it takes a village, right, to raise a child, and so we're really trying to get as many different people at the table. Um, and I think it's absolutely necessary in order to really get things done effectively. Thank you, um, really insightful. Uh, for Imrel, I wanted to uh, ask you about how you get inspired uh, for each different project. Most of your projects are focused in on solving a discrete problem. So that's my first question. And then as a follow-up, how can we translate what you do and what inspires you for your different projects to a city in the West, in the US. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can give this answer with an example, like th this is a one-time use glass. In, in Bangladesh, we usually use like on metal glass or any glass. Uh, which is actually recycled, we use it, we wash it, and then probably another person can use it. But what happens in our ideological change, like there are a group of people who are considering as manufacturer or any other terms, you can say investor or anything, when they are thinking this in a large scale or from a bigger perspective, they want something to use equal things or equal quality to everybody who can afford or whoever cannot afford it. They are producing th something which is not actually for greater period of time, which you can just throw after one use so that you can purchase it another time. And this will actually cycle the whole money things and all the capital goes to probably a few percentage of peoples. And at the end of the things, the low income communities or any other issues, they become the low income communities still. And on capital is peoples who are actually getting all the money. So it's, it's basically the difference between ideological things and how we can perceive the whole perspective of the development or any ecological ideology. So the, lots of things uh, depends on the ideological perspective and we need to bring ourselves from the a, a capitalist is required but this is not necessary for every perspective or every item which actually making the things much more complicated in larger perspective. Uh, also uh, in, in my projects I have always tried to integrate something which I can go for a much longer use, the resources, but not the minimal energy consumption. It can cost better, but we can use this resource for a longer time, not for a short period of time, which actually, and this is actually, I believe, is also needed like San Francisco or any other world in civilized urban things. So uh, thank you, this is. Great, so thinking about things, uh, you know, for longer use, duration, and, uh, you know, just everyday, um, you know, interaction, great. Um, so for Peter, 
uh, I wanted to follow up on the way that you analyzed, you know, smart growth and um, communities of um, in vulnerable communities. How does what we're talking about now with sustainability differ from the traditional gentrification conversation? Or what are the other challenges that you see in advancing, you know, how we think about smart growth and vulnerable vulnerable communities? Uh, well, uh, the challenge is that the the greening of development has made the conversation about the unintended consequence of gentrification and displacement harder. Um, there's something very comforting and, and cozy and, and, and right, if you will, about talking green. Um, and it's not to disparage, you know, lead or, or anything else, but uh, it, it, I think the development community has become very crafty of realizing the marketing opportunities around green and sustainability uh, as a way to move projects through the political process and to avoid some of these challenging conversations about the social or the economic questions related to development. And at the end of the day, you know, development is development. And if we take away uh, a lot of these kind of environmental or green features, it still has its, its same kind of raw impact, for better or worse. And so the old, you know, 10 years ago discussion about gentrification and displacement uh, had a much more kind of bright line to it. You know, who's winning, who's losing, who's getting access to the site? Is it for affordable housing? Is it market rate housing? You know, what's the change in the demographic? Now we have to kind of hack through, excuse me, not hack through, we have to, we have to work through uh, a project that appears on the surface to be uh, very palatable from those sort of 10 smart growth principles. And it doesn't mean that they aren't good principles. It just means that it's masking, perhaps, uh, some other more challenging questions. Thanks. So, Peter, I'm going to give the final question to you. I'm sorry, David. And I'm going to ask you, since you've been, you know, in this game since the 70s with sustainability and great design, and I know, yeah, I'm calling you out a little bit. Um, you know, where, what is the next frontier for architects with sustainability? You have a project coming online soon with the net zero cottage in, in urban areas. Is, is that the next frontier for architects? Is that what we should all be focusing on? Is it scale? Um, so in five minutes or less, give us the answer. Wow. Uh, you know, actually, I was, I was uh, born in a solar house. Uh, so my dad, who was uh, actually uh, uh, dropped out of high school in the ninth grade uh, and became, was a, uh, actually a migrant farm worker. He was a Dutch migrant farm worker, but he, he was. Uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, everything is new again, you know, is the way I'd put it. So, you know, I think, uh, I think in all these things, that's actually the big beef. There's been three periods of kind of uh, interest in green. There was one in the, actually the late 40s, early 50s, when um, uh, soldiers got back from World War II. There was a lot of, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright had done his Usonian houses, and there was a big interest in it. Then there was one centered around the oil crisis, and now the current one, which has been longer lasting and uh, spearheaded, spearheaded a, a lot in a lot of ways by U.S. Green Building Council. But, you know, people get tired. We, we are uh, people who, the human race, you know, gets kind of it's seeking new things constantly. And the, these... That the, the issues don't change, and that's one of the, uh, I, I was actually in Chicago and doing a presentation, I mentioned climate change, and this guy from Detroit said, you must be from California, because you're still thinking about climate change, you know, I'm like, whoa, you know, we're talking a 100 or 200 year commitment here to try to survive, but I guess it's, you know, it's done, we're done with that, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, so I would say that there isn't an, a next new, new thing. There's, there's the same things. And, um, you know, if you look at, uh, I'm going to take uh, interest. I, I, last year I took a trip in Northern Europe. I always wanted to do that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that people forget is there are all these really rich countries up there, which used to be really poor. And they basically, uh, you know, didn't uh, spend a lot of time uh, having a big armies and they educated everybody a lot. And those two, the combination of those two things resulted in this incredible affluence. Uh, so, you know, if, I, I would just say that uh, the, these situations are all um, can be dealt with. Uh, affordable housing is another one. You know, I was in, in um, the Netherlands, and 
they actually have, have built too much affordable housing there because they just kept building it. They started earlier and built more every year. And if you do that, after about 100 years, you have too much affordable housing. So, you know, it, from the head. <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, within our culture, and it's amazing, and the world is so uh, together, but it's just, it's, you know, if you talk about, you know, the third world, uh, I'll t tell my, I had a friend, they were in India, and they were trying to explain the idea of, uh, you know, a storage lockers, you know, to this family, and they said, you mean you pay, you are so rich that you pay people to watch stuff you don't use? <laughs> you know, it's like, and they were just like, wow, this person, that is insane. And to us, you know, storage lockers, oh man, I have all this crap I bought at Costco and I'm drowning. <laughs> I'm, I can't get rid of it because I pay a lot of money. I'm, I'm going to pay somebody to watch it. Uh, anyway, so, um, is that, am I ranging a little too widely? <laughs> Uh, I, I think we have challenges, and uh, you know, it's, hopefully, we'll reduce military spending. We will not. Uh, we will stay the course a little longer than uh, Bush did. Uh, it's going to take, you know, a, a long time, several generations, and then uh, we can have uh, equity and uh, prosperity for uh, for all. Well, that was fantastic wrap up. Closing thoughts, <laughs> David. Thank you, David, Peter, Teresa, and Emerald. Uh, this is a fantastic panel. And like I said, you know, fans of you all, uh, thanks. And I'm going to turn it over to Garnet uh, to uh, give us Garnet to give us our next. Well, thank you very much. This brings uh, this panel to a close. You can hear, you can spend more time with them. Uh, around over here, we have some uh, places where you can spend time with each of the panelists. So take advantage of that. I'd also like to remind you that uh, if you're looking for credits, AIA members get uh, two uh, SD credits. Not sure what that means, but it's probably a good thing. <laughs> uh, so we meet again at uh, 3 o'clock, I guess, right after we'll have an another uh, session that's going. Right now. right now we're going to meet, but if you please take advantage and, and, and spend more time with them if you like to. Thank you. <laughs>